Okay, so this is the forces in free fall lesson. Um, for those of you who had connected to me from my off campus notes particularly, but anyone, of course, is welcome to listen. So we have our template talking about, we're going to talk about what is free fall. We're going to connect it back to Newton's second law, which we've been talking about before, but haven't named specifically. We're going to review types of forces and how to draw forces from grade nine review. And we're going to look at net force also from grade nine review but really important as we start to build on uh, more complex single forces. Okay, so what is free fall? So free fall is when any object is under the influence of a single force. Only one force is acting on that object, and what object do we think that could be that's called free fall? That force could be? The force is gravity, surprise, surprise. Um, and this can, ha this can happen in two main types of situations. The first is where you uh, let an object fall straight downwards, this is the most obvious one. And the second is where you launch a, b a ball or a projectile or something upwards, and then it falls down. So a lot of times when students are thinking about things being launched and then falling back down, they forget that falling back down counts as free fall. Now in both of these situations, we have movement in the y direction, so the vertical direction, and we don't have any movement in the x direction. Now this is a big assumption. We're assuming there is no slight change in direction from side to side of whatever object is falling, that it's only going and has a vertical movement, um, but it's an important assumption we make when we're talking about free fall, especially at this stage in your physics education. Skydiving. Is skydiving actually considered free fall? Yes or no, why or why not? Take a minute and think about it. Hopefully you figured out that it is not free fall, and the reason why is because there is not just gravity acting on those skydivers. They also have air resistance acting on them, simply the fact that they are falling through the air. So here's a little video clip showing free fall on the moon. I'm going to... I'm going to link this video clip, I can find it again on YouTube, um, because when I record video clips in the screencast lessons, it ends up being way too big of a file to upload. So I will try and find this again on YouTube and put it for you guys, link it um, on school for you in the unit resources folder. Uh. This is about what is free fall. So when we're talking about free fall and objects falling, it's been a topic of discussion among physicists and scientists and natural physicists and philosophers for many thousands of years. So Galileo was one person who contributed this idea of our understanding of free fall, of falling objects, and he had a really important contribution. And can you remember what that contribution was? Well, he showed us that the acceleration is independent of mass with his experiment on the ramp and the different balls, showing how different places their acceleration wouldn't matter depending on the mass of the ball wouldn't change. And this is because the gravitation of the planet is constant. So the force of gravity can change, but the acceleration due to gravity does not change. And that's really, really important through this entire unit to keep that straight in your head, okay? So the force of gravity can change, but the acceleration due to gravity is constant. On Earth, that number is, anybody know? Negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It's meters per second squared with acceleration, and acceleration is change in velocity per unit time. Now, in true free fall, we have no air resistance. So how can we create a situation on Earth where we have no air to test this theory? Well, we use a vacuum. So to do that, uh, luckily, NASA has the ability to make, has a giant vacuum and a big silo they have that they use for testing their various space equipment, and the BBC was able to do a little experiment. And again, I'm not going to um, show you this in the screencast because it makes the file way too big, but I will try to link, find it on YouTube again and link it for you in, um, in the unit resources folder. Okay, but we're looking at dropping feathers, which is dropping a bowling ball in a vacuum and not in a vacuum. So this is a good diagram to kind of draw and analyze, and it's helping us understand how acceleration and gravitation are related. I remember when we're looking at formulas in physics, it's really important we understand the relationships between the variables, how they're connected, not just what they are. You can not just memorize a formula and then use it, but what does it really mean? How does it work? So, 
If we know that weight is the only force acting on the object, we know weight is the force of gravity acting on an object, we're assuming this is going to be a free fall situation, then we're going to say the force is equal to weight. And we know force is equal to mass times gravity, the acceleration due to gravity. Now, if we take Newton's second law, which is F equals ma, we've been talking this a little bit before, force is mass of acceleration, we can use this, and we can use this, and we can kind of equate them. So we can say acceleration, if we rearrange this formula, is force fed by mass. And then if I say that the force here is actually weight, because force is equal to weight, then weight over mass, okay, acceleration is now weight over mass, and I can eliminate the mass and the masses because it's dividing by, so weight is mass times gravity. Put mass and gravity here to replace weight, and I can eliminate the two weights. And now I just have acceleration equals gravity. So because I know that acceleration um, is force by mass and gravitation, okay, the force of gravity is equal to mass, is, is weight, so weight is equal to mass times gravity. I can eliminate mass and mass for both of these and just show that acceleration is gravity. Now this is only true on Earth, okay? So this shows us through a relation between two formulas, the idea that mass does not affect the motion of an object and shape does not affect the motion of an object. Now this is assuming that weight or gravitation is the only force. So be careful, these statements are not true if we have things like air resistance. Okay, but if we're talking about just gravitation, then the, both the mass and the shape have no effect on the motion. They have an effect on the force, but not on the motion. So Galileo predicted that all objects would fall at the same rate in a vacuum, which we did just see in our little video of the bowling balls and the feathers. Okay, now this is a list of forces that you guys saw in the ninth grade. So you can choose to write down, I will write down at least the names and the symbol for each of the forces here. Okay, um, if you remember what a force is, then you can kind of put a reminder, a summary. If you don't remember some of these forces or you didn't learn them because um, you're new to RES, then write down the definition completely. Okay, so we have gravitational force. We're talking about already a lot in this unit. It's a force of gravity due to the mass of the object being attracted, also known as weight. Friction, of course, is the force exerted by the surface as an object moves across it. <coughs> Applied force is when an object or a person is a, or applying a force to another object um, in some way using muscles, that kind of energy. Air resistance is friction of air as an object moves through the air. If you move your hand through the air fast enough, you can feel air resistance. Tension is specifically to a string, a wire, or a cable. When you pull that tight, you get the tension force. The normal force is often ignored. We don't think about it. Um, but Anytime you have an object in contact with another object, like sitting on top of a table is a great example, there is a contact force. It's called the normal force, and it is perpendicular to the surface of the object. So if I have a table here, and there is a little box sitting on the table, like my drawing, easy to do, okay, um, I have a normal force, which is perpendicular to the direction of the surface. The surface is horizontal. So my normal force is going to be vertical. Okay, that's the normal force that is acting on the box from the table, holding the box up. The distributive force we talked about already in this unit is when things are moving in a circle, the force acting on those objects, in particular that situation. So again, write down the ones, I write down all the names and the symbols, oops, um, but I wouldn't, and just write down the definitions of the ones you don't remember or don't, or need a reference for. Okay. okay, drawing forces. Also a review from ninth grade. So free body diagrams or FBDs are really useful tools for looking at forces and we're going to look at all the different directions and amounts of the forces acting on an object at a certain moment. So the size of the arrows shows us how strong that force or the magnitude of the force. So in this example here, all four forces, you have normal force holding the object up, gravity pulling it down, the applied force going this way, and friction going opposite to it. They are all equal length, um, so they're all with the same strength. If you think about the orbits uh, FET simulation we used for looking at gravitation and velocity, there was an arrow for velocity and an arrow for force of gravitation, and that was this kind of stuff, it's like a free body diagram arrows. The bigger the arrow, the stronger the force. 
So if a force was twice as strong as another force, um, what would its arrow look like? Well, it would be two times as long. So draw the little free body diagram example. I like to draw them as squares so it gives you a clear study ending point. Um, in the worksheet we did, it was little circles. That's also okay. I have a preference for squares because it's very clear if I want to measure it, where to start and beginning my measure. Okay. All right, so here's some practice questions. So we have a book at rest on a tabletop. Diagram the forces acting on the book. So take a minute, pause the video, draw it out. Okay, so check your drawing against this one. So I have my book here, and I have a normal force on the table acting on the book, holding it up, and gravitation pulling it down. Next one, I have a rightward force applied to a book, and we're moving across a desk with a rightward acceleration. So accelerating, that means the forces are unbalanced. Consider the frictional forces, neglect air resistance. So pause it and draw yourself. Okay, so here's the answer. So I have my normal force and gravitation are equal. Normal force is holding the book on up the desk. Gravity is pulling it down. And because it's not the book is not moving up or down, it's staying uh, still in the vertical direction, the y direction. These two forces are equal. It says a rightward acceleration, so the applied force is to the right, and the arrow here is bigger than the force of friction on the right, on the left, sorry. And we're not talking about air resistance here. A lot of the time we ignore air resistance at this level of physics. Okay, next one. A college student rests a backpack upon his shoulder. The pack is suspended motionless by one strap from uh, one shoulder. Draw the free body diagram. Okay, so it looks like this. We have tension holding it up and I have gravity pulling it down. Tension because it's a strap, which is like a string. Which has the, that's a force of tension. And notice how the two arrows are equal. That's because it is motionless. It is not moving. So I'm not accelerating and therefore my forces are equal. Okay, so let's talk about net force. So net force of an object is the vector sum of all the forces acting on that object. So we look at a vector sum, this is because it has direction and quantity, right? Vectors, of course, have direction and quantity. Um, if you look at this example here of the book, what is the vector sum of the net force on the book? Well, I have 18 newtons going this way, I have 20 newtons going this way, and if my net force is going to be 2 newtons to the left, because of this larger force here. Okay, race car, what's the race car one? Well, my net force is going to be 3 newtons to the right, because this force is bigger than the other one. Okay, if the forces are equal, if the net force is equal to zero, because the opposite forces are balanced, um, we say the forces are balanced on it, um, and then if the net force is not equal to zero, the forces are unbalanced. So balanced means I'm not accelerating, my net force is equal to zero. Unbalanced means I am accelerating in the direction of the net force. So anything with unbalanced forces is undergoing um, an acceleration in the direction of the net force. So if you see a hint in a question that says words like, it's accelerating towards the right, that means it's a net force towards the right. If it says it's going at a constant speed, that means it is not accelerating and therefore all the forces are balanced. Okay, so then you do practice on the worksheet, which I gave out to you guys to do in class. And I post the PDF version of that on Schoology for you as well. Um, you're going to have to use F equals MA to do some of the calculations and to draw for Y diagrams. Okay. All right, hopefully this is helpful for those of you who missed class, um, who had trouble with connectivity, or who just wanted to review. Take care. Do your physics problems, guys. Practice, practice, practice.